to recognize the need for change, the common break points that should be anticipated as a business grows, the principal drivers of change, the most common pitfalls and challenges faced by companies while maneuvering through the various changes. We'll also discuss some of the issues that arise as a result of the current economic and regulatory climate. Um, we'll also likely touch upon um, what David Thompson called the seven essentials in his book, The Blueprint to a Billion. These are essential elements that he found in 90% of the companies that he studied. Uh, companies that managed to turn ideas into billion dollar businesses like eBay, Amazon, and Staples, and Starbucks. Um, some of his ideas sound a bit like an infomercial or a motivational speaker uh, because he puts nice uh, headings on them. So his seven are creating and sustaining a breakthrough value proposition, meaning that they delivered breakthrough customer benefits that went beyond just uh, producing higher margins for their customers. Uh, two was exploiting a high growth market. Um, and as we discuss change tonight, our panelists will likely focus on understanding your mo market and being able to adjust your thinking and strategy to address that market. Um, more key customers, attracting the right customers um, who can sell for you just by being your customers. The fact that they're using your product um, it makes you all that much better. They're your sales force. Um, leveraging what he calls big brother alliances, using partnerships to create leverage. Becoming the master of exponential returns. Um, it's not about raising the most cash. It's about coming cash flow positive early and knowing how to scale a business. Um, the management team. He calls it inside-outside management. No one founder or CEO builds a company. You need to have the right team, recognize uh, the skill sets that are needed, um, and that some people are really good at doing the stuff that you need to do inside to build a business, and some people are the face of the business. <coughs> and creating the right board of directors, one that adds value and is balanced with industry expertise. Uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs focus on having um, a board that they can control, or uh, you'll find boards that are heavily uh, weighted with too many financial people. Uh, but a balanced board that includes customers, strategic partners, industry leaders, people who really understand your business was something that distinguishes companies. But the real key that's relevant to tonight's discussion is not these essentials, it's the trajectory these companies took and how the above essentials played into their growth pattern. In each, there were various inflection points in their business. When the company had its initial pipeline of customers, when the product or service was actually ready to be shipped or put into full operation, when the business needed to grow the organization from a management standpoint and from a functional standpoint so it could perform in order to sustain ongoing growth. The time to the inflection points was highly variable from company to company, but how the company addressed these inflection points is what differentiated them. Successful companies didn't let change happen to them. They were proactive and addressed changes and shifts in the business and the world in which they operated. So hopefully our panelists this evening will share with us some of their own experiences and insights with companies facing these challenges and provide advice and guidance for those of you who are building your own businesses. Uh, and for a few moments, I'll ask our panelists to give you a brief overview of their backgrounds and experience. Before I do, I just want to poll the audience and see who we have here tonight so they can get a sense of the mix in the audience. Um, how many of you are entrepreneurs or founders of early stage companies? Um, how many uh, CEO, you know, C-level executives at later stage companies? Um, business development types from big companies? Investors? <coughs> uh, students? <coughs> professors or academics? You get a few of those once in a while. <laughs> uh, and service providers? Um, also, a couple of quick items. You'll notice that one of our panelists isn't here this evening. Unfortunately, Barbara couldn't join us. She had a family emergency. Um, and then just in terms of format for the evening, uh, we'd like this to be as casual and interactive as possible. So while I have a long list of prepared questions and can bore you all night, um, I'd really appreciate it if you all just jump in and ask questions as we go, comments. If you want the discussion to take a different direction than we're going in, let us know. Um, this is all about you, not about us. So without further ado, Harold, you want to start?
My name is Harold Hambrose. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a, uh, a company based in Philadelphia with offices in uh, Raleigh, Durham, and London. Um, uh, Electronic Inc. is a uh, uh, service uh, consulting firm. We are about uh, 80 uh, professionals providing services to marquee clients in the financial services industry, the energy vertical, pharmaceuticals, you name it really. Uh, for 20 years, uh, we have been working with these companies to analyze the performance of their enterprise systems and employ product designers, psychologists, anthropologists, and ethnographers, and programmers uh, to uh, resolve main user adoption issues with uh, these $100 million investments that typically underperform in the hands of uh, their employee base. So that's what we're up to. Oh, and uh, no association with MIT. I'm from Carnegie Mellon. Where are you going? <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. I'm Meryl Miller. Um, good evening. I'm president and founder of Business Execution, and I'm an organizational strategist focusing on transformational change, helping take startups to the next level of growth. I've also worked with large organizations as well as um, other, what I'll say, business units and plants around the globe. Um, including Singapore, um, Ireland, Puerto Rico, and um, South America. And primarily focused on business strategy, <coughs> helping with business plans and business communications, getting organizations aligned, as well as leadership development and the executive teams, as well as um, re-engineering the business and redefining the business. Hi, my name is uh, Richard Fox. I'm with Cross Atlantic Capital Partners. We're based uh, right outside Philadelphia in Radnor, Pennsylvania. And uh, we manage about $600 million in capital. Um, we tend to be technology investors, um, investing in Series A and sometimes Series B deals. Um, Cross Atlantic has been in business 10 years. I've been in this business 20 years. Uh, before that, I was with uh, a company called Penn Mutual, and their subsidiary, Jamie Montgomery Scott, and I was in charge of their private equity. And uh, we've been we've been at it for the, we've been at Cross Line. We've been at it for the last ten years. We've had some very significant exits in 2007, which I'll hope to tell you about, and some of the uh, war stories on the other portfolio. Given the uncertainty in today's business environment. <coughs> What types of changes do you see entrepreneurs having to face that are different today than they might have been five years ago? For me, one of the biggest um, issues that I see many entrepreneurs facing is that, um, number one, oftentimes they do not look at business partners or alliances that they should be contemplating. And oftentimes they are looking at competitors strictly as competitors. And oftentimes, especially in today's market, there's a lot more synergy that can be created that people really should be looking at as part of their value proposition um, in positioning themselves. So um, that's one of the things that I've seen um, really shift um, from what was happening in the past. 10 years ago. And that's true of large companies as well. I, I neglected to mention earlier, I come out of um, J&J, DuPont, Sharon Cloud, and Bristol Myers, and they all have also gone through that kind of transformation as well. Uh, the availability of cash, right? Uh, it's harder to get it out of your bank, um, uh, and uh, that's, you know, that's just a fact of life. So. Uh, um, the notion of bootstrapping uh, some, somehow got, got lost during the last mm -hmm. uh, economic boom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no substitute for hard work mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And you, you own 100% of it still. You know, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, so I think that, uh, that makes things very different. Sorry, Richard. No, oh, that's all right. I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, in, in, in commenting on, on both of your thoughts, I, I think that the, 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 the industry has changed in the past five to ten years in the following way. I think that software development has changed. I think it used to be you have to spend millions and millions of dollars to put a product together. And in this brave new world, 
You don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. So you can go back to bootstrapping mm -hmm. because it doesn't cost that much. Because you can put a product together, half a million for a million dollars, you probably could put a, a decent product together. Mm -hmm. So I think this is this this is revolutionizing the industry. Because now the key becomes not the development of product, but the affiliations that you <coughs> enter into with others. The, your ability to partner, mm -hmm. your ability to get distribution. Mm -hmm. That becomes the key issues. Mm -hmm. So in the last five to 10 years, I would say that has changed, in my view, most dramatically. So, we all come at this from a different perspective, but in, in formulating a strategic plan or a business plan, um, you know, the entrepreneur always makes certain basic assumptions, um, and they have a picture in their mind of where the business is going. Um, but I'm sure that you've all seen <coughs> cases where, um, as I have, companies restart or morph into something else. Um, can you talk about some experiences where you're as an entrepreneur or one of your clients or portfolio companies, the company really had to significantly challenge the assumptions they initially made and really be willing to proactively change um, and accept the change in where, where the business was headed? Uh, sure. I'll start as the entrepreneur. Um, uh, I, I essentially uh, run a design firm that spent uh, a whole lot of its history uh, uh, reinventing the user interface of, of software. Um, what uh, became apparent to us in the last few years is that um, what the marketplace really needed is the same skills um, of analysis and redesign uh, uh, be applied to their business processes um, rather than the tools that will support them. Um, and uh, we had to shift dramatically. Um, I had to convince uh, a you know, a, a team of people who uh, had trained in designing physical artifacts, you know, screens of data on computers, had convinced them that it was just as, val as valid to design models of how organizations worked um, so that organizations could push and pull on those models and look for efficiencies, look for innovation um, in the behaviors of them. It was a, um, it required me to be sort of, you know, uh, sort of uh, a, compel a compelling and convincing leader. Um, I had to demonstrate to a team of people that um, people would buy this and had been buying this from us um, and uh, get them to sort of march to a slightly different beat um, they had, than they had for the last 15 years of the company. Um, we're ahead, it's sort of, uh, I think we're ahead of the curve. Um, people are, are now thinking these thoughts. Business schools are building design programs inside them uh, for precisely this purpose. Um, and it's, uh, it's nice that we had the opportunity to not respond, but really jump, uh, jump again. So there's, there's an example of really, I count on my biggest asset are the, the mm -hmm. sort of butts in the seats in the office, um, and I had to convince them to stay put um, and uh, do something different. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a bit before I let the others in. And from the other side, well, has it been in a situation where you change has sort of come upon you and you didn't proactively address it? Um, and what were the consequences? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I had this experiment in the late 90s uh, <laughs> with an office in Europe where I figured we would just do dot com business. Um, change came upon us very, very quickly. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, we were caught, we really caught with our pants down. Um, and uh, that was probably the most painful experience I've had as an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, to make some really tough decisions about, can we steer this ship in a different direction fast enough? Um, or do we cut bait? Um, and uh, that, yeah, we weren't ready. You want to know what I did? <laughs> <laughs> cut bait. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm going to speak about a startup that I started working with about two years ago. And actually, this was a very unique situation. Um, they actually are an IT firm that was developed um, by 12 shipping container companies who invested in this business to help them with their IT um, 
database and structure. And they knew that if they didn't invest in it, somebody else would come in and do it for them. And this IT group, they were basically IT gurus, I'm sure very similar to Electronic Inc. when they first started. However, when I was introduced to them um, about two years ago, they were starting to go to the next level of growth. And it was very apparent to me that they were no longer an IT technology firm, that they now had the capability around their value proposition to expand to end-to-end um, -end business process because they saw everything possible through their IT technology for those business container companies. They had all the customer information, so they had all of that data. So they, I started working with them about re-strategizing their vision, their strategy, and even their talent because most of their talent was, a, I would say, probably 99.9%. .9 they were IT people. And we started bringing in project management people who, instead of just having ID functional expertise, really had more MBA backgrounds and had broader business knowledge to shift them to the next level of growth. And it was very exciting because they were also going for their next level of funding. So I was able to get not only the stakeholders internally, but also all of the external stakeholders, their shipping container companies and their, uh, their future investors aligned with where they were headed in their business. So that was traumatic change for that organization. And um, they did very well with their investment as well, investors right now. Re reposition and restart are two words that I don't like very much, but I have to deal with every day. But um, what it means to me as an investor is that my uh, raison d'etre for investing uh, was incorrect. Something was wrong in my, in the, in my view, uh, in terms of making the investment. So now, as an investor, I have to think two or three things. One is, where did I go wrong? How did the company? How will the company reposition? Does it have the resources and management ability mm -hmm. to reposition? If the, if if I have some level of doubt with the CEO. The best thing to do probably is to walk away and take a loss, frankly, because um, the chances that it's going to be repositioned correctly are less. If, however, you feel very strongly about the CEO and you take baby steps toward repositioning, then um, I think it's possible it can happen as long as you have trust in, the, in, the, in that the CEO will tell you yay or nay that this will work or it won't work. So my antenna, repositioning means my antenna goes out. And I'm getting very nervous. But that's from an investor. Versus how often is it that, uh, that you make the call to reposition mm -hmm. versus in comparison to how often the entrepreneur makes the call? To well, I will not make a call in terms of the market because I trust my management to understand the market. The, the, the CEO will say, we need I mean, there's different repositionings. There's restarting right. to slightly repositioning to a major repositioning. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure that out, right? But um, what I'll evaluate is I've already been wrong in my evaluation of the original um, possibility. And when entrepreneurs start repositioning, what it means is that they don't believe they can win the war. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'll look at it. but and I'll evaluate it as a new deal. If you don't intellectually do that, mm -hmm. you could get into a framework where you just keep putting in money and money and money and nothing happens. So, it's, a, it's difficult. The question was how, uh, how do venture capitalists evaluate opportunities because they have to change every, you know, every one or two or three years and they have to evaluate that change. Is that fair? Yeah. So, and the answer is um, the only thing you have when you invest is your management team. And the ability of the management team to execute a certain strategy in the marketplace. And as an investor, you're not there every day. You might be there once a month if it's a board meeting. You might be there once a quarter. But you don't know what really is going on. So you have to have tremendous trust. 
that your CEO and that your management team is giving you a correct appraisal of the market. And the only way that, to, that I can make a judgment on the correct appraisal of the market is by looking at their numbers. Are their revenues growing? Are their customer lists growing? Is their pipeline growing? And are they executing? I'm going to direct this to you, Richard. I mean, you see a lot of companies. Are there certain types of assumptions that you see on a sort of consistent common basis that entrepreneurs make and that are consistently subject to challenge as the company grows? Things that you look at and challenge in making an investment and things that you think um, on a regular basis entrepreneurs overestimate or don't really understand the market or things like that that you know, are just consistently issues for them. Well, a million, a million things can come up. I was at a board meeting the other day, and it was an interesting board meeting because the company's pipeline seems to be exploding. It was, a, and that's a phenomenal thing. But the management team was unsure whether they could handle the growth, and so. I sat there and I said, look, I want to give you more money. Well, how much money can I throw at you to, to get the same? And they look like deer in headlights. For me, that's often the indication, though, that the people who start the business may not be the people who can take it to the next level of growth. And well, I think many entrepreneurs recognize that. That's certainly the first right. inclination, but you know, it goes right. deeper than that. Right. So then. I've had, since that board meeting, I've had numerous discussions about what are the issues. Mm -hmm. What are the issues? Mm -hmm. And then how are we going to solve them? Mm -hmm. But in this case, the management team was so busy that they didn't think the board meeting, I don't think, was that important. Yeah. <laughs> that happens, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think when they were presenting these opportunities, and, they, and I said, well, what do you need? And they didn't have an answer for me there. I think that also speaks to um, the leadership capability around, and I call it telescoping, and I was talking to a couple of people about this, is that those people have to be both strategic and tactical at the same time and be able to telescope in and out. And oftentimes, they may be um, at a very high level not able to execute and know what it's going to take to be part of that growth and to shift gears to make that happen. So I think that may also be contributing. Uh, and, well. the issue, and the issue that you two can certainly subscribe to is, and the issue here, is how scalable right. is the overall product. Because scalable products, if they're 100% scalable, we love growth, right? But if there's human element, if there are a lot of things that can go wrong, which is almost all of the businesses, then it becomes more difficult. So the more human elements you have, the more mm -hmm. processes that haven't been tested. So I'm not blaming these guys. I'm just saying that you know, it's you have only certain opportunities to really grow quickly. And you have to you have to take them quickly. And that leads very nicely into the next thing I was going to ask all of you, which is, what are the common breakpoints that you see as a company grows that entrepreneurs should be anticipating in advance? Um, something like that, where you know, they say, all of a sudden exponential growth shouldn't have just fallen on these people without any idea how to deal with it. Um, and there are others like that that come along in every company. Go <coughs> ahead. Recognizing what you don't know, um, and uh, when you need help, um, I think it, uh, a warning sign is uh, when you become so intensely focused on one issue in your business, um, the the light should be going off that you perhaps can't handle this alone. Um, you know, I watched uh, I watched myself become so intensely focused on sales at one point in our growth um, that you know all sorts of financial planning went out the window. Um, and so when the sales started to close, um, who was going to fund uh, the, the, the people I needed um, to, to, to fulfill those orders? And, you know, sort of, you know, uh, you know again, just caught. Um, that intense focus on just one part of my business should have been, should have been a, a warning for me. Um, and 
so I've learned uh, to be more careful since. Um, uh, some of the, uh, um, I, I think it's it's really a periodic objective assessment of the team that you've put around yourself. You know, I, you know, I, I started this company without a business plan. Um, I did it because I, I saw a need in the marketplace. It was kind of an experiment. I convinced a bunch of people to buy services from me. I convinced a bunch of people to come join me in providing those services, and you know, it's, it, it went from there. Um, uh, I woke up one day, figured out that the managers I had around me, you know, friends and relatives maybe were not not suited for the next piece, and and uh, I really needed to to go out there and find some expertise in the marketplace and uh, uh, get some real formal skills assembled, not just people who were equally passionate about this exercise. Um, that passion wasn't enough. Um, so, you know, knowing when, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> I guess is um, the rule. Having been in a startup myself, um, I can say that when I entered this startup, there were 50 to 100 people, and then we had two acquisitions. So quickly um, acquired, each of those businesses was about 50 to 100 people, and so with that, that became what I consider transformational change, uh, where it was necessary to really take restock of the organization, but then also start infrastructure issues. Um, and I can talk to that even on a large scale. For example, Sharing Plow um, was a smaller pharma back in the 50s and 60s, grew very, very fast, and never had that infrastructure to sustain them. And then when I entered in 2002, they had to do a lot of backtracking, not only from the IT side, but from all the infrastructure side. So I think it, it can be on a very large scale and it can be on a very small scale. Um, but I've also dealt with organizations that are 700 people and then grow, and um, that's, that's another transformational change, I would say. Also, those that are um, mom and pop or a single owner and then transition, that's another transformational change that is critical um, for that business and also often extremely difficult. Yeah, I think, um, I'm sorry, there's a question back there? Yeah, I just uh, have a very important question uh, from the venture capital point of view. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, <coughs> that uh, you deal with like a, you know transformational uh, uh, investment, which you encounter a uh, totally different market, uh, and also get into a radically different product or technology. Um, you mentioned something it's like a magic word, you know, it's a management, management, just like real estate said, you know, you ask the questions, location, location. Could you uh, <laughs> go deeper than that? Say uh, first, when you say the management, you are talking about the management of the portfolio company or management of your venture capital firm? And how do you know, uh, evaluate the, uh, the management itself are capable of uh, survive in a new, uh, totally new radical? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for it. What's that? I, a lot of it's just gut instinct. A lot of it's just gut instinct. We, I had, I had a, um, Years ago, we had a very high, kind of a hard-flying CEO, entrepreneur, and everyone believed him. And I was at a board meeting, and I knew he had had the technology discussion. He spent five minutes on it before the end of the meeting. And I sat there, and I said, you know what? There's something wrong, because he should have spent a lot more time on the technology. And so I start, I knew instantly then, and I've been wrong many times, but I knew instantly then that that guy had to go. So I think that's. But, 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 but that becomes more complicated because then I have a board. Then I have, right. I have a board who believes in this guy. And you know, I was younger then and I made the comment, I made the comment that I prefer a warm body to this guy because this guy was bringing us down. Every quarter, the revenues were less. He had the same 
bluster, but revenues were going down, margins were decreasing, and the technology wasn't working. <laughs> and uh, the company almost collapsed before the rest of the board decided that they had a problem. So many times you're working in a very, in a much bigger environment. You can't make that decision alone. Very, very difficult. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, transformation, it's, it's, all, it's all feel. Because if you have an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are the best and they're the worst. They'll get you to a certain point because they have the vision, they have the zeal, they have the ability to understand a market problem, get there. But many times, and I don't want to generalize, many times entrepreneurs don't have what I call the operator ability of executing a strategy once it gets to a certain level. So from an investment point of view, you need to be understand that where is the point as the company grows that it needs a change of management? Because if you don't get that right, mm -hmm. yep. odds are your company's not going to make it. Right. I'm trying to manage things insecure, try to run away mm -hmm. from a failure and to enter into a territory uh, just based upon faith, uh, it will be a disaster. Because mm -hmm. I think there's science, the person, you know, just maybe they devoted all their lives in one technology, mm -hmm. market, but without the courage to admit mm -hmm. they didn't know right. and try to sell himself or to, <laughs> to the board, that would be a disaster. Yeah, one of the things is that when you speak to an entrepreneur and they're hearing you, but they're not listening, <laughs> that's always a sign to me that there's a problem. Yeah, because he has no option, other option. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was going to mention, Richard, while I appreciate your intuitive capability based on your experience and exposure, I do believe, and it's because of my background, um, that it is possible to define competencies and assess an entrepreneur as well as an executive team based on those competencies. And um, it's been extremely successful in the work I've done as well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. If, if there is a understanding of the entrepreneur that they have competencies. Right. I right. understand. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. So that, that raises uh, a good question about the entrepreneur themselves, or even any business person at a growing mm -hmm. company or at you know, some of the big companies you work in, Merrill. Um, often people are uh, reluctant <laughs> to make any more than incremental changes in the business because anything big causes pain and disruption. Mm -hmm. Or an entrepreneur is often um, too emotionally invested in what's been done so far, so they don't really want to change. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with those issues? Um, for me, I um, often am the one who needs to hold up the mirror. And um, what that means is to give the feedback that no one wants to hear. And um, I, in a number of the scenarios we've been talking about, I think complacency is one of the things that is an obstacle for entrepreneurs in, um, not that they're not creative and not that they're not um, innovative, but they often are so set on their idea or their vision around how it is and not shifting it based on what it will need to be to survive long term. And so, um, I often have to deal with executives with their resistance, um, and the most important thing for me is developing rapport with them initially so that they will listen and they will work through their issues of resistance. Um, and that's very tough. Sometimes it's not an easy scenario, but I can tell you up front, I can pretty much tell with um, pretty good certainty if I've worked with somebody for a period of time whether they'll make it or not, whether they'll be able to handle that change or not. Now, your, your company's gone through some changes, and you've obviously had to face this firsthand. Um, how have you addressed this with your own team? Uh, so, uh, 
speaking for the entrepreneurs, yes, we do have issues. Um, but uh, a lot of us um, have built the notion of change into the model, right? So um, I think I think the last 10 years have taught us all that uh, nothing's guaranteed. And out of the gate, you've got to be looking for what you're going to do differently tomorrow. Um, and so I think that entrepreneurs today may be less resistant to change. I think they're smart enough to know that uh, maybe Maybe 20 years ago, in fact, I was probably guilty of it myself. I said, I'm going to be doing this. And I'm going to be doing this until I'm old and gray. And, um, and you know, maybe my wake up call was 10 years ago when really the, there was just a huge shakeup for me um, in our industry. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I think maybe entrepreneurs today actually have this, maybe have this tackled. You know, we, hell, my kids get out of bed now um, in a world that's so different from the one I used to get out of bed to. Um, you know, they expect all hell of a it seems, you know, because of what they've experienced. And I think, I think we, uh, we as entrepreneurs have learned that painfully over the last few years. So what advice um, can any of you give to companies that are experiencing exponential growth? Are there specific things that they should be doing, that they should, uh, that they can plan for, um, whether it's from a uh, you know, a human standpoint, building teams, or it's um, you know, being ready to, to get out there and, and get the right technological support, the right partners. Um, any suggestions? Yeah, I think that oftentimes you have to change your business model um, at those breaking points. You have to redefine your vision. You do have to look for um, complexity of talent in a very different way than you had initially, um, more sophisticated. Um, more adaptable and also more used to um, infrastructure in an organization. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, looking for uh, a certain level of maturity and experience mm -hmm. in the sort of, especially your senior level team. Exactly. Um, and uh, that may mean looking in places you didn't look previously uh, for, for those, mm -hmm. uh, those folks. In, in this economy, if you're experiencing exponential growth, change nothing. <laughs> Stay with that plan. <laughs> yeah, just to pick up on that point, you know, looking at places you didn't look before, I mean, a, a hard thing for a lot of entrepreneurs is to build that team to find the right people and know where to look. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of the venture capital funds now are trying to help their portfolio companies do this, but where do you look when you're not someone who's built a business before? How do you know what to do? Building your team, going out to, to assemble talent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that can be a very creative exercise. Um, I, I learned that uh, in my company, you know, uh, in, in some cases, people who are very skilled at the task, the service you provide, um, uh, may not be the best people to manage the folks who are providing that service. Right? So that was a, that was a big leap. Um, and going to market to find people with the management skills uh, with an awareness of what they were managing um, was really an art as much as a science. Um, negotiating that balance in the interview process is tough. Uh, figuring out if this person is really going to understand how to manage anthropologists who are consulting for an investment bank uh, to improve you know, business process effectiveness. You know, like that's 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 a very special skill, but also making sure it's profitable for, for the company um, and we're, we're scaling that. Where to look, um, uh, what is amazing is uh, the asset of, of the internet, right? So what what affords us, right now I've got an HR department who is sort of just managing conversations over things like LinkedIn now, um, where you can really probe into other organizations and simply ask questions of people. Um, where you think um, there may be deep management skills um, to go and ask individuals there through that channel um, about um, the profile you've developed to ask them to look at uh, position descriptions. It's a wonderful thing to do. Um, so there's, there's just good, there, you know, that, is, that and other channels uh, uh, out there are just uh, incredibly valuable. I'm going to approach that question in a little different way because one of the things that I profess as a career um, and executive coach 
is that I do believe that people should broaden <coughs> their expertise beyond their functional area and beyond their industry. And the reason for that is because often when companies are going to the next level, they do need people who have broader and more objective eyes than functional industry-based people. And so um, for me, a company that has been homegrown, let's say, um, very early in stage, definitely needs people who are much more sophisticated, who have come out of even larger organizations, who can then and understand business process from end to end, as well as the infrastructure issues, because that's the growth that's going to be needed in that organization, if not now, at least in the near future. Going, going back to my um, intuitive kind of way of dealing with people, but uh, I think there's people, there's really good people out there that have a lot of capabilities, but there's some people who fix things well. So, you know, sometimes you're in a situation where you need a product fix, but that's not the guy that's going to grow. So when he fixes it, he's probably not the person that's going to have this is where we're going to be four quarters out. So you need to identify where you are, where's that break point, and bring in, either augment the support and get that, you know, get a person who will intuitively uh, understand that it's about where you're going to be in four quarters, mm -hmm. not where you are today. Right. But in the meantime, you had this guy that was great fix-it guy. So, you know, as I get older, I get more simple because I think everything's got to be, for me, it's got to be A to B. It's like, do you have a scalable product? It's, to me, that is so key. One of the things we've done with the companies where we have investments or brought investors into is ask the CEO to do a SWOT analysis twice a year. And uh, I know the companies are in trouble if it keeps appearing the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But many times it does. It, it, it would it would seem to. Um, clearly, this company the company is always going to be moving day by day, hour by hour, week by week. There's there's going to be movements in growing companies and where where it goes. Um, so that's a very I think that's a very good exercise. Mm -hmm. Rich, you talked a bit before. Was a question out there? Yes. Uh, just not. I'm just sharing an experience. Uh, I come from the science, informatics, bioinformatics company uh, side, and um, one of the things that the early bioinformatics companies did was just take on people that had great science degrees or were great this programmers. And this uh, informatics is not either of them. It's mm -hmm. somewhere in between and not in between. So one of the companies that I worked for uh, designed unique tests for each function that they wanted to recruit for. And one of those tests was uh, a PhD in science or a postdoc would go through a set of logical skill sets and a whole combination of things and you could be knocked off at either of those even if you had the best postdoc ever. So that was a very interesting thing and I've been at three or four companies since then and I haven't seen any company do that and uh, going back I think that was a very valuable exercise. The other thing they did was recruit like Meryl was saying, uh, it is a software company it, but it is informatics but we have a lot to learn from the software industry. So they be abundant people from Sun and Cisco and all of those, mm -hmm. not because uh, networking is going to be useful for us but just to put those CMMI capabilities up front and the whole company adhered to that from day one. And that is not, again, not something that I've seen any company, even the best informatics companies have not seen, seen that happen, but it stood them well. Uh, they did go through their pains, laid off 50% of their staff, reinvented themselves, are a little, little bullish about uh, the technologies they own, will not adapt to the new semantic technologies that happen today, but still are wanted in the market. So. That's just that. Richard, you talked a bit before about board dynamics and how that plays into the whole thing when you're talking about a, a board that had really been invested in, in the CEO. Um, how important is the composition of the board in terms of driving change 
mm -hmm. in a company, and how do you make sure you have the right board? You know, I have been on so many boards, and I can't, that is such a tough question, because um, I've been on boards where I have individual, tremendous individual respect for all of the people on the board, but the chemistry just is not there. And I've also been on boards where I have, I've had disagreements with the board members about how the company's performing. And mm -hmm. um, I think, I, I really dislike venture-dominated boards. Mm -hmm. And again, as I've gotten older, I've gotten simpler. What I look for always, and I won't invest unless it's there, is an alignment of interests. So if you have a misalignment of interests at the board level, the company is going to have a harder time being successful. Different venture capitalists come in at different round stages. They come in at different prices. They have different uh, fun lives. They have, there's all kinds of agendas that develop from a misalignment of interest. That's why when Harold says, I like to keep 100% of my company, I understand that, I respect that, because he can control now what happens to his company. But if he has a venture capitalist that needs a liquidity event in two years, now he's got a headache. Now he's got a big problem. So you need alignment at the equity level. You need alignment at the board level. If you don't have that, so for example, if I go in to a deal that already has VC money in it, the first question I ask is what? Liquidity. Not liquidity, what's the options? What are the options? Is management incentivized? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you underwater? Mm -hmm. Do you have enough options to grow with? Because I want a management team that is uh, aligned with me mm -hmm. so that we're working together. If you don't have that, don't invest. Mm -hmm. And if you have that on your boards as it exists, then you got to work to change it. Mm -hmm. Because life is hard enough trying to figure out a market and grow in it mm -hmm. without all of the agenda issues that can come from a bad board dynamic. I would say, and also, um a bad dynamic with the president as well, and exactly. So there is work that I've done as well around um, board dynamics and executive team dynamics. And um, I think there needs to be strong alignment. And to your point, not only alignment around um, uh, common interests as you talked about, but also alignment around vision and strategy, which is very critical, as well as the business model. Yeah, you know, um, my, my wife and I actually sold a third of our company uh, uh, seven years ago to an active partner. And uh, prior to the, the partner that we had, uh, we were uh, in a deal, we were in a negotiation with, a, with another person. Um, and uh, the negotiation, uh, for all the entrepreneurs out there, um, the negotiation was so painful um, that uh, I finally said to my lawyer, does it matter that I hate this guy, um, and he said it absolutely matters. This deal's done, um, and uh, so we. I went back into the room and said, "We're not doing this deal because I don't like you." And uh, uh, he wasn't happy. Um, but he went away, and, and we found another partner who, for seven years, I, you know, he's been fabulously successful. We we are, are terrific uh, working together. Uh, we subsequently have hired. Uh, members of the executive team, and to be able to call, you know, to, to call it, um, this ain't working. There's no amount of repair work. There's there's no coaching. There's no change in these personalities. This is just not good for us. Um, and it's usually that individual is the most reluctant to recognize it. You know, mm -hmm. what do you mean I'm a jerk? You know, what do you mean I'm not effective? You, mm -hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean? Um, you know, to uh, I always feel like I wait too long to make those calls. Um, but again, they made it. Once you have the first, my view is that once you have a first thought about that, you're already six months late. Right. Yeah. I have a question in the back. 
Um, I help entrepreneurs um, grow exponentially. In, in your experience, what has been the most smooth, seamless growth and huge change you've seen? In my, in my experience? Um, we have a company that we started, we invested in, very interesting company, but um, it, we invested in it as a, a bunch of machines coming off a ship from uh, Russia. And uh, the entrepreneur that we backed put $5 million in it. His own money? Of his own money. That means a lot to me. That means, you know. And he took it to a certain level, and then it had to, we had to make a change. And the change that we made, um, we brought in someone who knew the industry well. But he spent the first two months on a plane all over the world talking to us customers, seeing what we do, what we do well and what we didn't do so well. And he changed the company. And today we're the leading, um, we're the leading provider in that market, uh, or public company. Um, and it was about, and this is another thing we haven't really touched on, but I was just thinking in the car a few years ago about what, what are the characteristics of my successful companies and my unsuccessful companies. And the only thing I could really come up with, and I think it's valid, though I don't have any data for it, is that CEOs who are close to their customers are a key ingredient to success. So as you grow and you have CEOs that are all over your customer base, that seems to be, to me, the key to success. Thank you. Question? I just wanted to go back to your board comment for a moment. I've been on boards of a couple of small companies and watched the boards of the large companies that I've been in. And one of the things that I it strikes me, and I don't know how generalizable it is, um, but board members who have never actually run a P&L, mm -hmm. and this includes VCs, mm -hmm. they don't get it. Right. So. Yes, you want a, a variety of people on your board. You want customers and people who know the marketplace. But when there are tough decisions to be made, or even decisions evaluating whether the guy running the company is doing a good job, the board members who've never run a company, they don't know how to do that. And they leave people in place because they don't understand, or they take them out sometimes when they don't understand. Sure. I'd, I'd appreciate if you'd comment on that. You're absolutely right. There's no, there's no, and a lot of VCs are extremely arrogant, mm -hmm. and so it's it's problematic. Um, I like to see a balanced board. I, I pay a lot of attention to who's on the board, um, and a board has to be, unless you own a majority of the stock, which in venture capital, you know, venture capital land, you don't usually. You have, to, you have to come to some agreement with your other board members by rational discussion. And, and um, you're right, a lot of VCs don't have operating experience. But having said that, and they, and they do, as a result of that, make poor decisions. But on the other hand, one of the things I learned early on as a VC, and this is my opinion, is when I was younger, I tried to micromanage things more than I do now. I don't try to do that anymore. I pick, <laughs> I pick my people on my management team, and I give them the support that I can. Because once I start managing something, that's not a good sign. 
I'd like to know what your ideal board would be, what the kinds of people would be on that board, and then I'd like to know how Harold has put his board together. Why don't you start? Great. So uh, uh, I, I have a board of three. Uh, and that's our, our, our chairman, uh, my wife, and myself. Um, and uh, we've never had a board. Um, and uh, I have instead um, exploited the talents of the business community in my city. Um, and that's served me well um, in two ways. Uh, one is uh, uh, I, I have the luxury of access to executives that a lot of other people don't, and they have good advice and counsel for me, the decisions I'm trying to make, and it's a good entree uh, into significant clients for, for, for my business. Um, and that model has served me very, very well. Um, uh, when the board was only two people, my wife and me, um, uh, that was, uh, I will admit, that was a rather weak board. Um, <laughs> because, uh, um, although my wife was an accomplished attorney, and um, I had a fine arts degree, and that makes us a, a sort of a, you know, a business powerhouse. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, bringing on um, our partner um, with, you know, with, with uh, decades of experience in business, having grown many successfully, um, uh, brought balance to this place and, and direction um, and rigor. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked for us. So I guess maybe I'm, you know, that's probably blasphemy to the business schools out there. I'd say, you know, you probably should not do what I did, right? Is that, no, you know? I don't think, no, I think whatever works. Are you guys going to, you're bristling at this, like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I don't what, think that's I'll, unusual. I'll tell you what I like. Okay. I like five people. I don't like seven people. I like smaller boards for smaller companies. And I like, um, I like, industry expertise to be at the table. So in my perfect world, you have an aligned board, you have the same economic interests, you have five people meeting maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, but I like monthly, particularly for small, growing companies. And I like people who can add network. People who can start, um, people who can, can can provide, build relationships and other um, avenues of distribution. Do you, do you trust customers as those industry experts? Do you, do you think they're good candidates for that voice? From, you mean the customers of the company? Yeah. Right. Would you put them on the board? I hesitate to do that. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be my first reaction on that because uh, because. They, especially if it's my biggest customer, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want them to know right. everything that I know, which, you know, other, they may not be a customer. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, just, just one follow-on question on that and a broader question. With the board composition in terms of the management team, um, besides the CEO or president, who else would you see as a candidate from the management team to be on the board? as opposed to reporting in, like I've reported in as a senior officer in a couple of different situations, but besides the CEO or president, who else would you look potentially to tap from the company? And the second question is back to the earlier discussion around alignment of the board. What are some practical ways to do that? Because in my experience, oftentimes at the board meeting, there's such a breadth of issues to cover, all the way from product development to sales to, to this to that, but it typically is, you know, reporting out, reporting out, you know, there just isn't the opportunity to get into as much of the depth discussion that often generates true alignment. Mm -hmm. So what are some practical ways to get beyond that sort of reporting across the company mm -hmm. type syndrome? You know? Sure. The chair, so, um, you go ahead. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, so your first question, just refresh my memory again, Refest. Who besides the oh, CEO or president yeah. would be a candidate from the operating yep. team potentially to be on the board? So um, in many of the startups, I have seen um, the founders of the organization, and I don't necessarily feel they should be on the board only because they are the founder, but oftentimes those people may be 
the scientific or technological expert. So to your point, Richard, they do bring the business expertise that is needed. I don't feel they need to be there if they're what I'll call the historian of the organization because sometimes they really have difficulty letting go of the past and going into the future. So for me, it's more about the technical um, expertise or subject matter expert that they bring. Um, the other people in the organization that I've seen are sometimes um, very strong technical contributors to the organization. Um, so they're similar to a founder, um, as well as other, um, what I'll say, competitors um, or people who have come from competitors who are now established in the business who bring new eyes to the organization. Um, so in a startup that I worked in, um, the president came from Compact and he was purposely brought in because he had those eyes. So there may be um, either industry or expertise knowledge that's needed to really hold up a mirror to the board. For that reason, it's really very, very valuable. Um, refresh my memory about your second question again. What are some practical ways to gain um, alignment beyond just sort of serving yeah, their, yep. their status? So I agree with you that often the board becomes what I call the dog and pony show. And, you know, everybody's presenting their hype about the project and, you know, wanting everybody to see it and showcase it. And what I often do with senior teams is I will have breakout groups on that team, depending on how big they are. And sometimes they're not just five people, but um, they will have what I call working sessions to really get down to the tactical level of project reviews and to make decisions, really strong decisions around certain components. Um, I've also had um, what I'll say, I often tell the group to send out proposals, like a white paper almost in advance of the board meeting, and use the time very well um, orchestrated in terms of specifically time for discussion and posing those questions in advance so that people are well prepared to have that dialogue and to gain that alignment and then have another meeting and or joint with that decision making as well. Um, but um, I feel strong facilitation is often the key as well um, to help build that alignment as well. But I often think it's um, other projects that may, um, projects that may be aligned to the business, but also other types of activities that could be helpful to the community. For example, you know, and I'm just pulling out ideas, um, if there's an, an initiative in Philly, let's say, that would really strengthen your partnerships with certain people, I'm sure that might be an event that your board, if it was bigger than just three people, might be involved in to engage them and to get them aligned in a way that's not just business oriented, which I, which I think is an important practical way to get them aligned and to start doing some team development around that as well. All good comments. Um, my only addition would be, um, having a chairman of the board that sets a very uh, concise agenda is very helpful. So usually in best run companies, the discussion of the board issues are before the board meeting takes place. What, what are the key issues that need to be addressed? They should be first thing in the morning because you're, you're most able, you got the coffee, you're most able to deal with those issues. Then the other issues should take less importance I mean, not that they're not any more important, but there's usually areas that need to be examined very carefully. So a good chairman will consult with all of the members of the board and come up with a good agenda. Thanks. Yeah. Question in the back? Wait, wait, wait till you get the back microphone. Okay. I mean, see, um, the issue about this alignment of interest, both at the board level, management level, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the key issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I give you an extreme example is that uh, in a combat situation, 
military situation, the two parties are for opposite, you know, uh, interests. Mm -hmm. They both want to eliminate the others. Uh, then you have a spectrum, you know, like this uh, uh, social type of thing. People are very congenial. In between, so from your, you know, <laughs> real experiences, how soon can you detect, you know, the uh, true nature of the group? Uh, for example, uh, you mentioned that uh, you find out the venture capitalists, if they have different, you know, expectation of uh, degradation, that's the thing. And also, how do you find out when they stated the ex you know, intention, is their true intention? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I would like you to share the, you know, the battle uh, experience from you uh, to, you know, to really, certain things you say, you know, ask you what's your, you know, intention, your interest. Right. People, in a lot of situations, people tell you what is it. But in situations, really a lot of money and power is involved. Uh, they may not tell you explicitly. You have to discover it, uh, you know, later. But anyway, I want your comments and experience. It's, you know, a board dynamic is very difficult because I've been, for example, and it's all a lot of it's personality. Like I tend to be impatient. You know, I just I'm impatient. So when I see something I don't like, I want to change it. Other people are much more plotting, and you know what? Sometimes they're right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have it, and I have it wrong, right? So um, you have to work within a framework of just dealing with people, right? But I think that um, the best way to do it is by communication and conversation. Now. When do I realize that there are different agendas? Well, there's many times during an investment, but many times when you have to come up with new money, you understand the agendas of the various people. Because if somebody's running dry on money, right, they're looking to get a quick sale. If they want a quick sale, they're going to sacrifice the uh, R&D needs of the company to show that the company is more profitable. Now we have a misalignment because I'm shooting for a hundred million dollar company and my fellow venture capitalist needs to exit tomorrow because he can't fund the company anymore and he doesn't want to risk the dilution. So if that happens, you've got to come to some meeting in the mind. Either you crush him if, if it's an inside round and that's not a happy experience. Or, you know, you uh, find some other way to take them out. I mean, I'm very sensitive to people who I had it the other night. You know, we were having dinner, and he says, you know, I, I don't think I, I'm going to be able to support this to my pro rata. I said, I understand that. I said, but, you know, my answer was numbers are numbers. So whatever it is, it is. I mean, I, I, there's, sometimes you can't solve problems. You just got to move forward. So, um, but... It can create all kinds of havoc with the management team if you don't have an aligned board. And the only way that you're going to prevent not having an aligned board is by making sure that you have an aligned board when you invest. And understanding the motivations of the various parties. I mean, I'll tell you another problem that I've had in the past is strategic investors. I do not like strategic investors on the board. Because what's their motivations? I've had, a, I've had a strategic investor drive a company into the ground so they could buy it cheaply. And I was unable to do anything about it. Now, will I do business with that company again? Never. And not all companies are like that. But this company was diabolical in the way that they strangled the company and they bought the technology cheap. Unable to prevent it because they had so much of an interest in the company. I'd like to hear about some of the other ways of unleashing growth. You, you've talked about uh, changing the business model. You've talked about uh, changing management. Uh, what are some of the other approaches? In terms of unleashing, unleashing growth. You want me to handle that? Yeah, go ahead. I'll jump in after. So Unleashing uh, growth is not um, something, it's something that comes from the outside. 
It means that you have you are right about a market issue. You're right about solving a problem. I always think this is about solving problems. Because the people who are successful say there's a real problem here, I'm going to address it, and this is how we're going to solve it. Right? So the market growth will come from the outside. And you'll see it from the pipeline. You'll see it from it's just a sense at the company level that you have opportunities. Next question, more relevant question, is if you were right, how do you execute that growth? I would say another um, experience I've had is redefining a strategy. So um, a business that I worked with, it was a very mature business and the market size was decreasing because of technology and growth. And so they um, started to look for synergies. They were a medical device company and they looked for synergies where they could be successful. And so they looked in new industries like sports medicine and women's health and that's where they started to grow. And so I would say that that's another way that you could have substantial growth and they continue to be successful. And that was a dinosaur business. It was a dying business and they knew it. Wait for the microphone because everybody can hear you though. Uh, going back to this uh, quest, uh, discussion on alignment emotion, and I'm creating a scenario here that's a real one, where um, a licensing university gave the technology to a CEO because they believed in the CEO. Mm -hmm. And the CEO had to recruit a management team, of course, but the original inventor of the technology did not, could not come to be part of the company. Mm -hmm. So the next choice was to have someone else who had worked with the technology to come on board. But the CEO just didn't have the right wives and just didn't want that person on board, just couldn't get along. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just just the feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but pra practically, and so it would have been the right choice. And then uh, the CEO decided no. and. This other person has gone on to start another company, still works with this company, licenses the technology in a different way to develop something else around it and things like that. But um, given that this was a very niche technology, there are not too many other people out in the world to bring into your team. So if you were given this scenario, what would you have recommended? That the CEO uh, go with this technology person despite the emotion or uh, this was a good enough decision and the reason I'm asking that is because the company is struggling because of the lack of the right technology person. So, so it, you know, people are people, right? So I, I don't care how many MBAs you have behind your name, um, there's a certain chemistry amongst individuals who have to share a space right. and that goes back to the cave, right? So. Um, you know, the, the question you might want to ask is that original guy that you described, is, he just, is this individual just disagreeable to anyone who's a threat? Is, you know, I would look very carefully at that person mm -hmm. because maybe that's just the wrong person to be. Sort of no, I don't think so. It was just what with the CEO. Everyone else was okay. Right. So, so I, you know, I, I think we lose sight of the fact that, you know, some people are just going to just not work well together and you just can't, you just can't force a square peg into a round hole. And the sooner you, you, you call it, the better you're going to be. Um, because for whatever difficulties they're having, um, uh, you know, you're probably going to have much worse if you force those two people uh, together. Right? Okay. My sense of it may be a little bit different. Um, I think, um, and you're going to hear my view on change, people aren't in cha won't change unless they're in pain. So it depends on how much pain the CEO is in as well as um, and willing to make it work. So if the organization is struggling, like you're saying, obviously they're in pain and they really do need help. And it also depends on how much self-awareness the CEO has as well as that technical person. And if they're willing to um, have a facilitation intervention to have it work. 
Um, I have seen very significant <coughs> relationships built once they understand where each other are coming from and why there's conflict and why there's problems and what's, what's the underlying dynamics around it. So I really don't know enough based on just what you've said, but it, it, there could be many, many factors that are coming into play around that. Um, but I would not dismiss it but just out of hand. I think there's significant work that can be done. The psychologist on my team will tell you that personalities don't change, right? Um, you, know, you, you just can't change that about people. Um, and if that's the, the core problem, you know, maybe it does take a lot of interventions. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. About, about five or six years ago, I went to a breakfast um, with the CEO of JetBlue. JetBlue was a rising company back then. Mm -hmm. And the uh, person at breakfast said, what would you do with all the labor issues at United what would you do if you were CEO of United? And he, without, a, without a second, he said, I would immediately resign. <laughs> and so I thought it was an interesting comment because there's just some things, you know, they're just what I call the area of brain damage, and they're not going to work. They're going to do something else. Your time's too bad. One last question, and then we're going to wrap up. So. <coughs> Uh, another question in terms of board composition, and um, referring back to an earlier comment about uh, at least the majority of uh, board uh, members should have PL experience. Um, what is uh, your opinion on academics as board members? Um, insightful, unorthodox, or um, tiresome? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what, what my, my first instinct is advisory board. My first instinct is have them on your advisory board. Um, and, but I, I'm also careful not to paint a broad brush because when you do that, you screw up too. So I'm sure there are a lot of <laughs> academics that can add a lot, particularly in terms of network, in terms of where things are going. So um, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm, I went, Necessarily, I mean, on a five-person board, probably wouldn't be my first choice. Well, you also have to distinguish. I mean, some academics are true academics; that's been their whole life, Correct. and others are very successful in their own right outside of the academic world. So, um, it really depends on the person. You, you yeah. can't paint a broad brush. I mean, one of the startups I was with, the academic had a um, Nobel Prize for technology, and he was phenomenal. And so. It really depends on the individual. I don't think you can really make a generalization. So just to wrap up here, I'm going to bring it back to where we started. Um, and in, in this wonderful economic environment we're in, um, with a lot of uncertainty, both financially and from a regulatory standpoint, as to where the world's going, um, what final words of advice do you have for the audience? Uh, don't lose uh, sight of the basics, right? You, you got to sell stuff, um, and uh, you can strategize until you're, you know, uh, until the cows come home. Uh, but that that doesn't close deals. That doesn't drive revenue. At the end of the day, you got to sell. Um, and so I see a lot of entrepreneurs investing on hell of a lot of time and effort, uh, forming strategies, um, and never actually doing business. Um, and talk about tiresome, you know. Um, you know, don't forget, we're in this to make deals, so that's, yeah. yeah. For me, it's um, change is the only constant, and also um, don't forget about your people um, and your talent, the, that side of the business, the human side. Um, and I was quite impressed that most of the discussion today, if I was tracking it, was more around alignment and board composition, which I'm really pleased to hear because um, the leaders of an organization are significant, significantly impact the growth and profitability of that organization. My final comment probably goes back to my first comment, which is that the future is the changing patterns of distribution and partnering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, the internet, because of the cloud, because of the, everything is very different today. That the key, the people who will be successful sitting here in 2010, in 2015, will be those who figure out 
partnering and distribution better than others. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our panelists and thank all of you for coming. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.